Wait till you hear our take on Bergevin's press conference, and we'll tell you what you can expect from the Canadians next season. This is Hockey Inside Out. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Adam Susser. Here with me today, once again, is Mr. Stu Cowan, CBC Daybreak's Jessica Rosnack, and Mr. Chris Nyland. Let's start the show. In all my years following the Canadians, I cannot remember a season quite like this. Expected to finish at the bottom of the barrel, the Canadians turned in many players who produced career years, the team missed the postseason by a hair, and in the process, gave its fans as much of a taste of playoff hockey as you can get without actually making the playoffs. Will the team pick up from where they left off in October, or do you think Canadians fans will be disappointed next season? They have to pick up where they were and be even better next season. Uh, Mark Bergman's news conference, I mean, he talked about how things are just getting started. Uh, for the team, yes, for him, it's year eight. Um, but they're definitely on the right track. I mean, it was a quite an, a very impressive turnaround this season uh, from where they were last year, where there was no hope. There's hope now for the Canadians. 25-point improvement coming so close to making the playoffs. Missing the playoffs for the second year in a row and the third time in four. Missing the playoffs three years in a row will be unacceptable. And I think heads will roll if that happens. Heads should roll if that happens. But this was a big step forward. And I think there's a lot of positive going towards next season. But it'll be interesting to see what Mark Bergeron does over the summer to make this team better. A lot of players, as you mentioned, had a career year, and some people are saying, well, would they be able to do it again next year? But I'm going to just hit, use Brendan Gallagher as an example. I remember at the golf tournament, people were talking to him about the career year he had the prior year and his uh, record-setting goal, a career high for goals, and they said, you know, do you think you'll be able to do it again? And he said, yes, absolutely. I want to show people that that wasn't a flash in the pan, that I'm someone who's able to put up 30-plus goals year after year. And I think if everyone sort of has that mentality that Brendan Gallagher has, that it wasn't just a one-off, that this is the kind of player that they are, that will help the Canadians continue to build on what they were able to do this season. Yeah, after the miserable season last year, uh, Molson uh, told Mark Bergevin to fix it. Mark Bergevin came out and said, I'm going to fix it. He has fixed it. Not all the way, but he's fixed it. This team is now turned around going in the right direction um, uh, from where they were last year, 25 points better. Um, they have a, 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 a better attitude, which he addressed um, at the end of last season. So there's a lot of positive signs, and again, it's all going to depend on how he adds to this now. And yeah, it will be his eighth season, and uh, it'll be his second season into the retool. So they have to make the playoffs and hopefully um, do some damage in the playoffs. Not just make it, but do some damage in the playoffs. And they're going to need a power play to do that. So he has his work cut out for him this summer. Uh, it's great that he got things turned around. Uh, I'm happy he did. Uh, and uh, this team, this team, uh, I think they're all hungry to get back here and get this thing going again. It's, it's, it's tough to go out the way they did. But, you know, they were a unit. They were a team. Um, I, I, I like what he's done. Well, Bergeron has a lot of critics out there, and rightfully so, but when Molson decided last year to keep him, you almost have to wipe the slate clean. Yeah, you do. Starting, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. he was given a fresh start last season, and his first season with his fresh start, he did so many good moves to get them where they are now, but now it's on him to get them. The right. ice is a little bit thinner yeah, for him. Yeah, I, I totally agree. But he definitely made the most of that fresh start. Uh, during Tuesday's end-of-season press conference, Mark Bergevin said that Jeff Molson had given him permission to spend up to the salary cap. Do you think Bergevin will be able to lure a top free agent to the Canadians during the offseason? It's always a possibility. We'll see what happens. You know, I, I, listen, he, he has a good personality, Mark Bergevin. And he, He's a good dresser. <laughs> and he can sell. Uh, and, you know, listen, I remember Petrie at the end of the playoffs here that year. Yeah. Where everybody's worried he's going to leave. He stayed. There's a lot of good things about playing here, too. I think we tend to look at the negative, oh, the media, and, you know, everybody's up your butt all the time. But uh, it's a great place to play hockey when you're winning. Obviously not when you're losing, but that's anywhere. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, he has the money to do it. Hopefully he can, um, 
he can do some smooth talking. Carey Price, I think, will be the bigger salesman. The best quote out of the Canadians cleaning out their lockers <clears throat> Tuesday came from Price <clears throat> when we asked him, said, what, how will you sell Montreal to free agents? And he said, because my window's closing and I want to win really bad more than ever before. Yeah. So that's a message to the free agents. It's also a message, I think, to Bergevin that you got to do something. I mean, Carey Price is 31. Uh, he played fantastic this year, but how many more years can he continue to play at that level? The time is now for Mark Bergevin to go out. And he's going to have to overpay to get a big free agent because of the tax situation here and everything else. But he has the money to overpay, and he's got to bring someone in. There's hope, but there needs to be more hope. They need, a, they need to bring in like a point-of-game player, which this team has not had forever. <laughs> you know, see, Matt, so going back to Matt Snazlin was the last player, Canadian's player to finish in the top 10 in scoring in the NHL. They need a point-of-game player. If you can get a center, that would be great. You allow Domi to move to the wing. You're really strong down the middle, but he's got to he's got to really push to get yeah, it. I, I had a point every like two and a half games. <laughs> <laughs> but I think right now the Canadians are. are they can still because they can still use you. Right? Even if you play one shift a period, I'd pay to go watch that. <laughs> You'd be great in the dressing room. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, but they definitely are in a better position this year than last year to attract free agents. And I think Nate Thompson is a, is a good example. They picked him up around the trade uh, deadline, and he said that he wanted to come to Montreal. That especially being on the on the West Coast to know what was going on in a team on the East Coast. That a lot of times you're just sort of focusing on your division that he said he liked what was going on over there and wanted to join in, wanted to jump on the bandwagon and see how it went. And he's really enjoyed his time here. So I think with players like a Nate Thompson, who's an American, wanting to come and play in Montreal, that maybe some other players are saying, you know what, perhaps Montreal is somewhere I want to play. And as you mentioned, having Carey Price, who when the NHLPA had their uh, surveys that they do every year, that Carey Price was the most highly regarded goaltender in the league and the one that's most difficult. So you might say, why not see what Carey Price is able to do? Well, Max Domi loved it here. Thomas Tatar loved it here. Uh, Bergevin had an interesting quote when he said he's had players before who wanted to come but their wives didn't want to come. You know, you look Just at get rid of the wife. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, there's a lot, that Montreal is a much more appealing market right now than it was last year. And I think for a guy coming in, you're looking at, there's young talent, there's Carey Price, uh, Shea Weber is still there as captain. I think there's reason to come here now, but again, Mark Bergevin is going to have to overpay. That's just the reality of, of, of working in Montreal. Curious to see if he will overpay because he doesn't like to do that for anyone really, except Carl Alsner. Well, in his defense, well, Carl Alsner was a big mistake, but in Bergevin's defense, for not spending the money the last couple of years, there wasn't. They, you know, they wanted to get John Tavares. He didn't no want to talk to them. They wanted to just so, so exactly just to spend it. it stupidly, yeah. and then you're never going to hear the end yeah. of it. Yeah, and that, like with Carl Alsner, I mean, and, and if he hadn't signed Carl Alsner, he'd have even more money right now to go free yeah. agent shopping. But that's ancient history. If the Canadians don't win a playoff series next season, do you think Mark Bergevin will be fired? I think if they get into the playoffs, it's fine. <laughs> He'll, yeah, he'll be okay. I mean, my, Jeff Molson's shown if he wasn't going to fire him after last season, he obviously likes the guy and, and the way he operates or whatever. So, But if they miss the playoffs next year, I don't see how they can bring him back. And I think if they miss mm -hmm. the playoffs next year, you got to wonder about Claude Julien's future also. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, I think there's going to be a lot. There was no pressure on this team this year. Nobody expected anything. They, over, they, they surprised everybody with the way they performed. It was a happy ending to the season. People feel good about the team again. But if it's a similar situation next year and they miss the playoffs by two points, I think it's going to be a totally different attitude about, towards this team. Yeah, that I think that Mark Bergevin couldn't survive again missing the playoffs. But it's also who's kind of around that you're looking that could take this role of the GM right now in the hockey world that uh, has to be bilingual with this market that there's, I think, because there's not really anyone sort of saying, you know, I'm here, I'm the guy in waiting to take over that position that I think that has allowed Mark Bergevin to keep his job uh, totally. longer than other GMs in different markets. That's the thing. You, you fire know, we him. heard a damn yeah. Foose's name before. Mm -hmm. We heard Cobb all. You just never know. But... You know, Bergevin, if they don't make the playoffs, yeah, I would think uh, he might not keep his job. Uh, if they do make it, he'll be in there. And I, I just think, you know, you talked about the clean slate, which is awesome. Uh, we have to remember that this team has made a whole lot of progress. And we got to understand, too, that uh, it's progress. It's not perfection. I know everybody wants perfection. But um, they're on their way. That's uh, you know. I just I hope they can add to what they have. Well, if he had, if Molson had fired Bergman <clears throat> last season and a new GM came in uh, and had a 25 point improvement, everybody would be praising this yeah. guy. Right? Yeah. Saying this guy's a yeah. god. He turned it around. And Bergman made the mess. He's Molson let him clean it up, and and he did. So it's but now 
the, the, that was sort of like the spring <laughs> cleaning. Now they need the major cleaning and get everything. Marie Kondo spring. cleaning. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> it. How would you rate Claude Julien's overall performance behind the bench this season? I think he did a good job uh, overall. Uh, obviously, the um, big, fat, sore thumb was the power play. But I think he's made adjustments. Uh, he has a, a, a team that I, I think he was not accustomed to coaching, a, a team with speed. He changed his style a bit. Um, come on, he was a really defensive-minded coach. Uh, down in Boston, you know, they had trapping teams, physical teams. This team was a team with speed, um, a lot of gusto, and uh, I think he did a good job. I, again, the power play, you know, they can say you delegate responsibility for that to Kirk Muller and to whoever, Dominic Ducharme or even Luke Richardson, but the fact of the matter is the head coach is responsible for all of it. And um, if it's not working, you got to step in and fix it. And that never happened this year. And there's some on the coach, and there's also some on the players. But a lot more on the players because, come on, how many schemes can you really use on a power play? Uh, at some point, it comes down to execution. Yeah, I mean, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I guess you can teach an old coach new tricks because he did change his philosophy and the way the team <laughs> played this year. I think he took a page from the Vegas Golden Knights from the previous season. The Canes attacked on offense. They attacked on defense. They were, they were aggressive. They used their speed. And um, kudos to Claude Julien for doing that. I don't know how much of a role Dominic Ducharme played in that also, but I'm sure he had a pretty big role as far as bringing in that system. And Luke Richardson was sort of the... Uh, the unsung hero of this mm -hmm. team this year. The players, even at the cleaning at their lockers too, like everybody to a man just praised what he did this year, how calm he was, the calming influence he was, the respect factor he has. Uh, I mentioned the Shea Weber, you know, and when you watch Luke Richardson doing drills after practice, he looks like he could still play. And Weber said, yeah, he still could play and he'd still scare a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was a tough customer. So, um, yeah, Claude, I think, got a lot out of this team. I mean, you look at, you know, those nine guys had career best seasons so you know, the coach has to get a little bit of credit for that right mm -hmm. and he was also a coach who vet uh, who favored the veterans and this year he changed mm -hmm. that philosophy from game one by scratching thomas mechanics and then also with carl alsner saying mm -hmm. you know what i don't care about your contract i don't care how many years you've been playing in the league if there's someone else and it's can, iron man street yeah exactly if there's someone else that can come and get the job done then they're going to be the ones out there that no one is getting a pass no one's history is allowing you to be uh in the lineup uh, and I think that was really important. And I think especially with a young team like this, this showed that to the, all the young players that I could be in the lineup every single night and take a spot from a guy who's had it for the last, you know, X amount of years. Yeah, that might have been his biggest show. I mean, he even made Andrew Shaw a healthy scratch for a couple of games, right? When Shaw came back from his offseason uh, surgery. Yeah, he was and, struggling. And he, did, and he was struggling. And Claude told him, you're going to sit down for a couple of games. I want you to work in getting that half step back. And Andrew Shaw did and came back and was an effective player. So the season is over for the Montreal Canadiens. What were some of your highlights from the team this year? I want to say Thomas Tatar because uh, when he came over in that Max Pacioretty trade, it was more uh, Nick Suzuki who was like the, the highlight of it. And then Thomas Tatar was kind of thrown in with it because of the way he was struggling with the Vegas Golden Knights. People were saying, you know, perhaps he's washed up and he's no longer going to be a player that's going to be serviceable for the Canadians. He came here, uh, he had a great season, but he also really seemed to embrace the city and loved it and every moment of it and, every, and became that fan favorite of Tuna Tartar. And if you go back to the guy at the Bell Thomas Center. Tartar. Yes, and then Thomas Tatar went and found the guy invited him to the game, gave him a tour of the Bell Center, and I think uh, that's one of the highlights, that he became a player that was great on the ice, but also off the ice as well. Yeah, Max Domi also. I mean, Max Domi came in, I mean, almost hit 30 goals, and I, I don't wonder how he did that. How did he only score nine goals in Arizona? Like, you watch mm. this kid play, how did he only, and what, four of them or five of them were empty netters in Arizona? He was just came in here, and he just, I think they talk about the change in the attitude and the atmosphere. I think Max Domi had a lot to do with that. He came in that room. He's an engaging guy. He's a smart guy. He seems to be a fun guy to be around. And I think he provided a spark on and off the ice. And, of course, Jesperi Kotkaniemi also brought in a breath of fresh air and was sort of the little brother to everybody. Mm -hmm. That was another, you know, there, was, there was quite a few pleasant surprises this season. I'm, I'm not going out on a limb here, but... Um I'm the first guy that said ta-ta, okay? <laughs> Not that guy at the Bell Center. I should have got the tickets <coughs> because I said it first on Off the Cuff. Thomas ta-ta, okay? Let's get that. Copyrighted. Yeah, let's get that straight. Um, Kokinemi for me. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a kid who, you know, uh, are we going to draft the sentiment and this and that? Sentiment, 
uh, here. Obviously, that position has been a sore spot for the last 20 years. Uh, dying to get a guy in here. They bring an 18-year-old kid in. Oh, is he going back to junior? Is he going to be in Laval? Uh, it, no, not junior, but Finland. going back mm -hmm. to Finland. Is, is he going to Laval? What are they going to do with him? Is he going to be here after 11 games? And you know what? The kid comes in, surprises everybody. He, he has a level of maturity that uh, is beyond his years. Um, he can play in his own end of the rink. He's intelligent. Um, he's full of life, big smile on his face all the time. This kid is such a breath of fresh air for this organization. Um, and, and with him up the middle, boy, and, and the other guys they have, Paling, and uh, for me, he was the biggest surprise um, bar none. You know, a kid that they were looking at number 12 in the draft, they had him rated 12, 14 at one point, mm -hmm. and they drop down and take him. And, um, for me, that was the biggest surprise. I think if there's one word to describe this season for the Canes, I'd mint. use fun. I, well, mint is one. <laughs> yeah. The other one yeah. is fun. Mint. <laughs> yeah, mint. I mean, last year they were bad and boring, but they were fun this year. It was yeah. a fun team to watch. It was an awesome watch. team They were watch. entertaining, and nobody was more fun to be around than Jesperi Kotkin. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If, the, if you're a Canadian fan, I think it's, it's hard to just choose one uh, highlight. For me, it was Kotkin Yemi for sure, my, fir my new favorite Canadians player. Uh, Paling's debut was what a way to end the season. Mm -hmm. And just, uh, you know... Bergevin was right. Attitude problem. You know, I loved making fun of him last year. He didn't give me a lot to make fun of this year. So those are just a few of my highlights. Okay, we want to thank you for tuning in to this week's show. We will be back next Thursday before we take a break for the summer. What were some of your highlights from the Canadian season this year? Let us know in the comments section below. I'm Adam Susser, and I'll see you back here next Thursday. <laughs>